you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of uh, Genesis, chapter 3. I want to title this The Great Fall of Humanity. The Great Fall of Humanity. And I would also put up under the parenthesis, Satan and his tactics. How many of you know Satan has some tactics? Amen. Let's, let's read a little bit here. It says, chapter 3, book of Genesis, starting with verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. Isn't that something? God made the serpent. That's right. He made the serpent. He said to the woman, now, and the serpent could talk. Isn't that amazing? He could talk. Can you imagine how beautiful God's creation was before there was sin? I, I can't even fathom that. And the serpent said, he said to the woman, did God actually say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you should not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Imagine not knowing good and evil. Imagine that. And then, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took up the fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin clothes. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God said, uh, called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? Uh, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me to be my wife, to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. Amazing how the, the chain of command just goes all the way down. Everybody's throwing everybody under the bus, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. And it goes on and on and on. Father, we just pray for your word here this morning. We pray, pray for listening ears and attentive hearts. We pray, Lord, life-changing moments through your Holy Spirit in our life. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would just show up and be present with us in a mighty and glorious way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 The serpent's plans, obviously, when you stop and think about this and, and do somewhat of a dichotomy on that, the serpent's plans was to attack God through God's creation, because he couldn't attack God so he came up with another scheme. I will attack God's creation. He raised questions about God's motives and the truth of God's word. So think about this right. Satan, which was the serpent, then become Satan. He used the serpent to become Satan in the midst of this. And all of a sudden, he's de deflecting on everything that God had already told him. Adam and Eve believed Satan's lie, and then they began to act on it. And see, we can get caught up in deception, right? And deception is an awful thing. If you've ever been deceived, and I've talked about this on many occasions, sometimes, especially when people get deceived in the church, I want you to know, 
almost 99% of the time, they'll never come back to a church if they ever feel deceived in the church. But you're forgetting one thing. There's been pastors who have been deceived. They've been deceived by their congregants. They've been deceived by people that they thought were good people, and yet they have been baffled. And some of them get hard, and they no longer want to pastor anymore. So we have to be careful. I have been in places of leadership, even within the church, that people have deceived me, and I thought they were good people. But they have backbited and talked about me and gone to other people and did some hideous things. And I tell you, as a pastor, I got angry. I got very angry because I had placed a lot of confidence within these people, and yet I was hurt. And I had to pray through that thing. This is the reason why we have to have a devotional time with God on a day-to-day -day basis. You see, we cannot live for one day for God and think that we're going to ride off of that anointing for the next day and the next week. Folks, that's why he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things should be added unto you. What is he saying? You have to do this every day. Renew your spirit. Renew your mind. He said, brother, and I urge you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good acceptable and perfect will of God what do you have to do you have to do that every single day of your life I was talking to a friend of mine earlier this week and one of the things that we both suggested I said he said, well, how, 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 do, how did God keep us? I said, God keeps those that wants to be kept. God keeps those who have a relationship with him. God keeps those who spend time with him. God, spend, God keeps those who wants to live close to him, walk with him, uh, commune with him, and understand him a little bit more. Doesn't make you perfect, but God will keep you. He says, he says this right here in Jude 24. Only one chapter in Jude. But I love that scripture. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of your glory, the presence of his glory with exceedingly joy. God is able to keep you. He's able to keep you with exceedingly joy. I look at that and I'm thinking, wow. And Adam and Eve believed Satan's lie. And then they began to act on it. As a result, the, as a result, the curse of sin came upon humanity. Now, then God pronounced his consequences, severe consequences, as a result of their choices. Now, let me tell you something. You and I, and I've said this on many occasions, you and I get to choose the choices that we make. But we don't get a chance to choose the consequences of those choices that you and I make. That's why we need to seek the face of God. God expects obedience to him and acceptance of his word is the absolute truth. You can't change that. That's why he said, if any man adds to or takes away from this word of God in the book of Revelations, to him it should be accused. You cannot change the word of God. It's sealed. And for generation after generation after generation until Jesus himself returned, the word of God remains the same. Why? Because it is the truth. Have you ever seen anybody that tells a lie? And they keep fabricating the lie. The lie is never the same. Yeah. Yes. I would always, every, you know, it, I, I always use this analogy because it, it, it really helps me out a lot. I remember when my kids were young and they were going to school and I would take them to school and my wife would pick them up in the afternoon. And every once in a while there would be some dispute or something that happened in school. And I only went about three or four times. And I would go to the school and I would say, but before I went to school, I would ask them, so tell me detail what happened. Because yeah. I'm going to the school for your defense as a father. And I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to hear no lies. I just want the truth. Because if you tell me the truth, then I can sum up, should I go or not? 
and we can deal with this. And they would tell me, they said, okay. And then uh, about a couple of hours later, I would ask them again. I said, hey, listen, I'm going to the school tomorrow. I need to know. Tell me that story again. See, I'm testing to see if that story is going to be the same. Because I have already recorded that story within my mind. And then the next morning, I would say, okay, I'm taking you guys to school. I'm going to see the teacher or the principal. So let me get this straight. Tell me the story one more time. Now, if the story never changed, they were telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And the stories never changed. I would do that every time that I went. And like I said, in the 12 years of both of them, I don't think I went no more than three or four times in the whole 12 years between the, the, uh, the uh, two of them. But I always wanted to hear the story three times because three was the final answer, right? That, that was the finished deal, it was sealed. And I said, if I hear it three times and the story has never changed, then my kids are telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And they were, because they had no reason to lie to me because I'm going for their defense. And so the word of God never changes, it remains the same. You cannot fabricate it in any kind of way. That's why God expects our obedience and as well as the acceptance of his word as the absolute truth. It is the absolute truth. There is no ifs and buts about it. I don't care who are Nobody, but nobody would never be able to change my mind away from the love of God. That's why the scriptures say, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no depth, no any other creature should be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Why did he say that? Because he had a conviction of the truth. That's what Paul had. He had a conviction. Satan knew this and he tried to destroy Eve's faith in God by raising doubt and God's motives and his, and his instructions. You see, here's the problem with Adam and Eve. And you know, I wasn't there, you weren't there. You know, you can make a lot of assumptions, right? And we all make mistakes. I'm not here to ridicule them. I'm just looking at it from a different perspective, a biblical perspective, that may be able to help us. Because one thing about it, when it's the truth, the devil will always raise doubts. Right. And you need to understand one thing. God is not the author of confusion. Right. Okay? This is where I always question myself when I'm making some decisions. If there is a lot of confusion and doubt that's going on, I want to tell you something. It's not God. It's not God. When I make big decisions, you know what I say now? Lord, I want you to know, if this thing is turning out to be a mess and it's not a new, of you, please close the door. I won't get mad with you. You're saving my soul. You're saving me time. You're saving me energy. You're saving, saving me heartache. And you're probably going to save me some money. So, Lord, I'm not asking for permission. I'm just asking that you would do what you need to do in my life to prevent me from a mess. You see, but here's what most of us began to pray. Lord, I need you to do this. I need you to do, I, I need you to do this, Lord. I'm depending on you to do this. And it may not be the will and plan of God because the enemy may use that thing to come against you and between God. And you can't allow that to happen, folks. That's what he does. That's why Satan knew. Satan suggests that God really did not mean what he said. Let me, let me tell you one thing, folks. Look, God means what he says and says what he means. So, so there's no confusion. There's absolutely no confusion. God, again, is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints of Christ Jesus. How many of you know sometimes when we come to church, we think that, hey, everybody is saved, everybody is saving, serving God. I'm going to tell you something. Satan comes to church. The devil will come to church. Did you know that, listen, everything that will happen to get you to church, the devil is going to try to stop you from it on Sunday mornings. He will stop you in any kind of way. Your car may break down. 
You may have, you may be running late. Anything you can, don't go. It's raining. It's coming down. Anything could happen. Listen, you would get up and go to work if you had to. There was never a time that while I was working in the private or public sector that I let the rain stop me from going to work. And I would drive from here to San Jose and it would be pouring down. I just got there slower, but I got there. How much more should I do that to praise my Jesus? Amen. 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 I mean, come on, folks. How much more should we do that to praise God? Nothing should ever stop us from coming to the house of the living God. But Satan would do that. This is his, listen, Satan suggests that God really did not mean what he said. Did you know that that was the first lie that Satan proposed to a human being? Yeah. And that it was the denial of the judgment of death. That was his first lie. It was the denial of the judgment of death because God told him, as sure as you eat this, you will die. And Satan tried to trick them and say, oh, surely God did not mean that. One of the primary sins of people is unbelief in God's word. That's one of the primary sins. Because you know what? We think that we have it all together. We, we justify our junk. The moment that you and I justify something, we're already sinned. Because we're looking for a way out. Well, you know, the reason why I did that, because this right here, you know, they were going to do this, so I had to do this. And you start talking to yourself, I had to do this, Lord. You know, I didn't hear it from you, so, you know, I had to take action on this right here. We start thinking that we're God. Oh, I know I'm not going to get a lot of amens on that, but that's okay. Hello, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So, and, and, and this, is what, this is one of his primary, God means what he says. Satan will tempt us to believe that we are like God. And that we can decide for ourselves what is good and what is evil and what is right and what is wrong. We don't have that type of power. We don't have that power. Only the Holy Ghost can reveal that to us. Amen. Only the Holy Ghost can reveal that to us by how much Jesus is within us. Amen. I want to tell you something. You want to get away from God? Get away from God, his relationship with you, and get away from God's people. How many of you know you can stop coming to church for about two, three weeks? About the third week, you say, you know, I don't need to come no more. You know, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Then you start thinking about uh, some, somebody in the church ain't right. Maybe the pastor ain't right. Whether I'm right or wrong, it ain't none of your business. That's something that God has to deal with the individual himself. God has to deal with that. He'll deal with you whether you are right or wrong. Your job is to do and be obedient unto the word of God himself. And to spend time with him. Did you know that God is a jealous God? He's a jealous father of you. And so we should be careful about the moves that we make. This, again, is what separated Adam and Eve from God. And they became false, God, false gods for themselves. You see, this is how witchcraft came into being. And we got a lot of that here around the Bay Area. These psalmist people, they palm readers, some whatnot, sorceries, whatever you want to call them. It's, it's just witchcraft. And God would never, never put up with that because... This is what got Saul into problem, right? He, he's, he went and, and, and had communications with the witch of Endor. You don't do that because things aren't going right and you're beginning to lose hope in the God. Which, the, his, listen, when you're down and out and you're beginning to lose hope, the first thing you should do is get down on your knees and begin to pray. Lord, help my unbelief. Amen. Lord, help my unbelief. Amen. Lord, because I need to get reestablished again, bring to I, there is never, I want you to get this this morning, there is never, never, ever a time that I have sought the face of God and after I've gotten through praying, I didn't feel hope. Amen. Never a time in all the years that I have served God, there has never been a moment that after I had gotten through praying, released my soul unto him that I didn't feel confident that I could live another day. People ask me, why do you pray every day? So I can stay saved. 
so I can continue to serve God because I know who I am because I know I'm capable of making a mess you see you got to be honest with yourself folks because if you ain't honest with yourself you're going to lie to everybody else including yourself I am not going to lie to me so who are you fooling that's like somebody said listen I'm on a diet but you know what I'm not going to eat but a little bit and that little bit, and then you keep eating, oh, that ain't much. I'm going to keep buying. It's like me eating a whole box of seized candy. <laughs> and I love seized candies. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to eat that. And I buy, here's what I do. I buy a box of seized candy every year. And that's it. I don't buy it no more throughout the year. Because I can get addicted on that. You know, I sit there and I eat half a box before I go home. You say, wow, that's a lot of chocolate. It is. Because I know I ain't going to eat no more of it. I'm done. I'm done. You see, and I'm, I'm saying, oh, you know what? It's just one more piece. It's just one more piece. You know, just one more piece. And they say, you know, the whole box is gone. It never lasts me over two days. So I don't buy it anymore. I, I don't want it in my house. Keep it out of my house. Somebody send me a truckload of chocolate for my birthday. I said, why did you do that? I'm going to bring that stuff to church and make everybody else fat. You see, God knows. People will try to gain moral knowledge and make ethical judgments using their own reason without sound judgment of God. You cannot do that. God is still the ultimate judge of yours and my right and wrong. That's right. A good and evil. He is the ultimate judge. Yeah. And when they sinned, their moral and spiritual death came immediately. The physical death then come into later. But it's morally and spiritual death. If you think about it, morally, God's life died in them and their nature became sinful. Think about it. God's life died in them and their nature became sinful. Spiritually, their former relationship with God they was destroyed. Why? Because of the decision that they made. And their former innocence was replaced with guilt and judgment. You know one of the things I've learned, and I'm sure you have too, it's hard for righteous people or sinner to be around righteous people that they know that they are righteous. And they ain't got to say much because they feel guilty and shame. And it's not the person. It's just the righteousness through the Holy Spirit of that individual that convicts their sin. And they have to make an ultimate choice whether they're going to surrender their life to Christ or not. I'll leave this right here with you. And it's something, because as we look at this, and it goes on, we see that one blames another. You know, Eve blames the serpent. And then uh, Adam blames Eve. And then God calls him in the midst of the woods and then he's hiding from God. Well, why are you hiding, brother? Why are you hiding? You see, sin you always want to hide from. But the truth is always exposed, so let's always stay the same. It'll never, it, it will never change. The truth remains the same. If somebody goes out there and they look at your car and you say, oh, you got a black vehicle. I say, yeah. And I, they said, oh, I saw, you, I saw your car the other day. It was a black vehicle, and I saw you getting out of it. I said, yep, that was me. I can't change the color of my car unless I go paint it, right? And I ain't about to do that. And so not that everything remains the same when it is the truth. But I want you to listen to this this morning because I think it's so important that we understand one thing, that when you don't know Jesus, listen to this, when you don't know Jesus, you're just merely existing. When you don't know him, when you don't serve him, when you don't walk with him, when you are not living for him, you're just merely existing. But when you wake up in the morning and you have walked with God, and I was thinking about that the other day. I was here praying and I'm sad. And I, I, I break down when I pray because all of a sudden the Holy Ghost just zooms in. And I said, my God, I've served you for over for 43 years of my life. God, you kept me and you're still keeping me. 
Oh God, I'm not perfect, but you have kept me, Lord. And, and, and now my life is fulfilled. You know why my life is fulfilled? It's not fulfilled by things. Not fulfilled by the fact that I'm a pastor or I have, I have accolades or some influence. It's fulfilled that I'm serving him. That I know where I'm going after this life. And that my life is so much fuller by serving him. Oh, I'm just a, I'm just a normal, ordinary individual. But I know Jesus. His word is buried in my heart. He told me to delight myself in the Lord and he would give me the desires of my heart. Amen. He said that his arm is not shortened that he cannot save me. Neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear me. He told me if I wait on the Lord, I shall battle with wings as eagles. I shall run and not be weary. I shall walk and not faint. He told me that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. All that are heavy laden and weary come to me and I will give you peace. He told me that there is a peace, John, that surpasses all understanding. Hallelujah. He told me that I can feel that inner hurt inside of you and I can save you and I can commune with you and I can walk with you. And I will never forsake you or leave you in a time of need. He told me in 1 Corinthians 2.9 that I have not seen, nor have you heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things in which I have prepared for you that love me. Amen. Ah, he told me as far as the east is from the west, as far as I have removed your transgressions away from you. I ain't seen no human being that could do that for me. I've never met one. I have never met a human being that could do for me what Jesus is doing for me. So I say to you, if you don't know him and not following him, you are merely existing. You're just living from day to day. The person that lives for Jesus lives with purpose. I live with purpose. You see, I live with purpose. I live. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen in the next few minutes. What's going to happen tomorrow? Those things, they never give me anxiety. They never push me, oh my God, this or that. I don't have to worry about it. Because great is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Right? You know, and, and look, and, and this scripture I, I, I just love. It's without controversy, great is the mysteries of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached amongst the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. That does it for me. That does it for me. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. That does it for me. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. But more than anything, that's what he did to Adam and Eve. He baffooned them. He tricked them. He deflected the real issue. And you know what the real issue is? The real issue is the truth. The truth. I meet with people sometimes and they say, I said, what is the real issue? They said, the individual just can't tell the truth. That's all I want is the truth. Because people can live with the truth. If you say, you know what? I'm just no good. I'm telling you right now, I'm no good. There's, there's nothing else that you have to worry about. They done told you, right? I'm no good, I'm a liar, I'm a cheat, I'm a thief, I'm no good, you don't want to be around me. You should know that, don't think you're going to change that. They done told you the truth. Once you find out that they lie, you should be questioned. Wait a minute, what, am I going to stick around? Oh Lord, you see, this word remains the same. 
We're not perfect people, but it remains the same. And once it remains the same, it should change our hearts, it should change the way we think, change our motives, change our tactics, because Satan has used his tactics to trick you and me to leave God, and that's a lie. Would you stand with me this morning?